Shadow Secretary of State. Prior to her election, Kate was Chief Executive of the Child Poverty Action Group, and before that, Director of the National Council for One Parent Families, and that's now Gingerbread. She's a long-standing advocate for children and families and a campaigner against, you know, such a successful and influential campaigner against poverty and inequality, serving as a member of the London Child Poverty Commission and the Greater Manchester Poverty Commission. She was previously a member of the National Employment Panel, which advised ministers on labour market policies. And she was chair of the Fabian Society from 2016 to 18 and remains a member of its executive committee. So Kate, we are delighted to hear, have you here at this virtual Union Learn conference and really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Oh, thank you so much, Mary. And it is really great to be with everybody to talk about something that is really, really dear, I think, to the hearts of everyone in the labour movement, something of which we're immensely proud, the success of the Union Learning Fund uh, over the best part of the last uh, two decades. And the way in which it has transformed lives and that video just now was so moving and powerful in reminding us of how for people who've perhaps never before had a good experience of learning perhaps have it's been many many years since they were last in any formal learning at all how it has opened up new possibilities for them um, and really enriched their lives not just financially although it's great when then people's earning uh, power is improved by uh, training and skills but actually, um, the, the pleasure of learning and, and of discovering one's capacity and potential and making the most of that, it's really inspiring, I think, to see particularly adults with the courage and the commitment to, to make the most of the opportunity that Union Learn has offered um, to over a quarter of a million workers now. I mean, that's in each year, that is a lot of people accessing Union Learn. And I also want to say thank you to the 44,000 union learning reps uh, up and down the country. So important in the work that you do um, with employers in your own unions and with Union Learn to, to broker that access to learning opportunities. Uh, one of the things I've been doing over the last few weeks since we heard the devastating news that yet again the government wants to cut this really uh, excellent programme has been to talk to some of those union learning reps in my own region in the northwest and to hear about some of the work that they've been doing and the, the commitment and the, the, the passion that they have for their job um, is uh, really inspirational and I pay great tribute to everybody who, who's um, making that contribution. It's very, very valuable. The government's decision to slash the Union Learning Fund, not for the first time they've tried to do this, um, really is perverse. It would be perverse at any time when we look at the reach that the team achieves, particularly uh, to those who would be very unlikely otherwise to engage uh, with formal education. But it's particularly perverse now, um, as we're in the height of a pandemic, where we're seeing significant risk of job losses, jobs perhaps in some industries gone for good, um, where we're seeing people uh, at the same time, of course, having some time when they could be learning because they're, they've got this time on furlough, they're at home, uh, or they may be um, now sadly unemployed and could be learning. Um, and the government has repeatedly refused to respond to the calls from Labour uh, to use this time effectively uh, to give people the chance to access and learn new skills. Um, and it's particularly perverse too, because the programme is especially effective at reaching priority learners, those who need basic skills or level one and two, those looking for ESOL courses, traineeships, um, over 90,000 learners um, in, in the most recent year in those priority groups, those um, early level skills. These are exactly the learners that the government tells us are important but that have already been excluded from the new initiatives that Gavin Williamson announced a few weeks ago. Um, those level one and two courses were completely omitted uh, from his announcement on further education and skills. And it's also really important, I think, to recognize that what we do in cutting off union learning is we cut off the massive benefits, not just to individuals, but to the economy. Um, and with an economy now in, in a really difficult situation, why would you not take this opportunity um, to upskill the workforce? So I want to assure you on behalf of the Shadow Education Team and the, the Parliamentary Party, we are absolutely committed to campaigning with you to do all we can to protect the Union Learning Fund. 
We um, are looking for opportunities to raise the matter in Parliament. We've already had uh, a couple of chances to do that. I was able to ask a question of Gavin Williamson a few weeks ago, and my colleague Graham Morris has an early day motion tabled, uh, which we will be um, encouraging colleagues to sign. And we will look for more opportunities to press this matter over the coming weeks. But we know that we have a big uh, fight on our hands to persuade Gavin Williamson and indeed other Conservative ministers uh, that they need to back off this perverse and stupid decision. Um, and so we very much want to work with all of you to look for every opportunity to support the TUC's campaign and individual unions campaigns uh, to make the loudest noise that we can in the hope that we will be able to bring home the need to reverse this perverse decision uh, before March next year. I think Mary too, when um, um, I was invited to come and speak at this event, um, I was asked also to say a little bit about broader skills priorities for Labour. Um, obviously, as I say, absolutely crucial as we go through and, and hope to come out of this pandemic um, to ensure that people um, are best prepared for what is going to be very, very uncertain economic and employment times. And we have repeatedly stressed as the Labour Party the importance of lifelong learning. Um, and we set up in the previous parliament the Lifelong Learning Commission under our former skills minister, mm -hmm. uh, my great friend Gordon Marsden. Um, and I think that's given us a really good foundation for the kind of policies that we will want to continue to promote in this parliament. And I very much hope in the next three or four years uh, to take into government. Um, and I would say a few things that will be particularly um, priorities for us in taking those ideas forward. First of all, building on what I've just said, we do want to ensure that learners can access lower level courses. The government's lifetime skills guarantee, is, guarantee as I say, is aimed only at level three. It offers no support to those who need basic skills for level one and two. It offers no progression plan uh, for those learners. Um, and without that support, of course, they're never going to be able to progress to level three and therefore will be locked out of additional support. Secondly, maintenance is a core issue, especially for low paid learners who face not just learning costs, uh, but living costs, which can be a huge barrier to additional learning. And that's why we've been calling repeatedly for training to be integrated into the job support schemes so that there's no trade off between getting the skills that you need and making ends meet right now. And if the government is serious about, as it says it is, wanting parity between further and adult education and higher education, it needs to address this issue of maintenance support, which it has failed completely to do in its skills announcement last year, last month. Um, and then the final thing I think was to say that in line with our Lifelong Learning Commission uh, recommendations, there needs to be a genuine right for people to retrain. Um, the rights that working people have now are really very narrow, really very limited. So we are saying that that must be a lifelong right to train, to restrain, to upskill and to come back to do that as often as needed and wanted. The labour market is completely uncertain and the future very unpredictable now. It's very hard for us, I think, even to manage, imagine the jobs in two or three years time, let alone the jobs of five, 10 and 20 years from now. What we do know is that investing in our workforce and maintaining its skills is absolutely crucial to our economic success and prosperity yeah. as a country. And Labour understands that that investment in the workforce isn't a one-off. It's something that goes on through all of our working lives. It ensures that we are um, putting ourselves in the best position economically as a country. It gives individual learners the very best opportunity to maximise your own skills and your own earning potential. And of course, we want learning to be enriching and rewarding in its own right and for people to feel that they do have the opportunity to develop all of their potential. Uh, and that is something that Labour is very, very committed to. Kate, thank you so much. That was a great, great speech and uh, a great analysis of uh, forensic analysis of what is not there in the Conservatives proposals for lifelong learning, in particular, the entry level courses to lifelong learning and the support for it. And a great um, uh, reminder of what Labour has committed to in the Lifelong Learning Commission uh, and, uh, uh, and its support for lifelong learning. And, and as I said before, you know, what we know about Union Learn is for every one pound invested in Union Learn, employers get 12 pounds return. People individually get better wages, they get more interesting jobs, they are more skilled. And that has such an effect 
not just on their working lives, but on their personal lives and on their family lives. It, 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 it ties people into a society where they feel that if they do work and learn, there is a route for them. And if you take that route away, then, you know, you, you, you take away all the individual life chances, which then are not available to people. And employers become less, you know, less profitable, less able to create jobs and less able to uh, work with unions in, in these ways. So thank you so much for your speech. Now I'm hoping Yusuf, we can now move to Francis. Hello, can you hear me, Mary? Yes, Francis, hello. <laughs> See, I think this is a metaphor, Mary. It's like, I mean, I admit I was like head in hands, can't get online. Uh, thanks to Yusuf I am, but you know, is it going to work? But we keep persisting, yes, just yes. like we do with Saving Union Learn, and we win through in the end. But Mary, first up, just to thank all our brilliant Union Learning reps for everything that they do, and our partners um, and allies that we work with too. Uh, thanks to you, Mary, for your brilliant leadership, and to Kevin and the whole team. And can I just say, it is a delight to share a platform with Kate Green. Uh, she's not only got this, you know, brain the size of a planet, which is always a good thing, but she's got her heart as well. And I think people who don't know should know uh, that Kate has a long track record before she ever went into Parliament of standing up in particular for single parents. Yeah. Um, which I appreciate and for children from poor backgrounds so you know that is the spirit of union learn it's the spirit of trade unionism um, just just to say to uh, everybody here today we all know we are in the midst of a massive massive challenge and I think all of us also want to pay tribute to our wonderful key workers and not just NHS and social care workers, but the posties, uh, the train drivers, the bus drivers, the delivery drivers, the shop workers who have looked after us and are looking after us yet again throughout all of this. And I think, I know this is Union Learn, but I think it's important that we also recognise that there are two million of those key workers on the national minimum wage. And that's not good enough, Mary. I think we all know that's not good enough. And we have to fight for a decent increase in the national minimum wage to a real living wage, but also for fair pay for everyone. Um, without doubt, from our perspective as a trade union movement, the biggest threat we face is mass unemployment and the poverty that comes from that. You know, we've seen the brilliant Marcus Rashford uh, leading that campaign for free meals for children, uh, something that education unions have long been calling for. Mm -hmm. But this is going to get a hell of a lot worse unless we prevent mass unemployment. Um, and I've never been prouder of the trade union movement in the way that we stepped up on health and safety, sticking to our guns, getting that joint guidance. Not good enough. There'll be more from the TUC on that. But nevertheless, be in no doubt, without us, uh, we wouldn't have had uh, the push on safety that we've had. Um, and the fact that, you know, by winning that furlough scheme and some support for the self-employed, again, not good enough, but be in no doubt, nearly 10 million workers' livelihoods depended on the furlough scheme that the TUC lobbied campaigned and pushed for alongside our unions so we should be proud of what we've achieved so far but we know that this fight is far from over uh, we've got to save jobs for sure but we know that the, there is a rising tide now of unemployment and redundancies with young people in the front line of that particularly young women and young BAME people but now older workers facing redundancy too and we've had that hokey cokey of are we supposed to go into work or stay at home um, with millions working throughout but this shouldn't be a competition between health and the economy What's so clear is that unless we get control with a good test and trace system, uh, with good controls and high safety standards, then we 
are going to hurt our economy more. And if, you know, frankly, we've seen that just last Saturday with all that dither and delay on the lockdown that has cost both lives and livelihoods dear. Uh, so we have been pushing uh, for job creation too. And let's be clear on that front. You know, again, young people um, bearing the brunt so far, but we don't want Mickey Mouse jobs. And one key test of a decent kickstart uh, program for us is whether or not there is real off the job quality training. That tells me and it tells everyone whether or not this is a decent training and job scheme or whether it's just uh, you know, like a throwback to the 1980s, those who remember YTS and Yops. Uh, and we need a decent welfare system too, Mary. I mean, again, you know, we need higher universal credit. We need help for working families with child benefit. And critically, unless we sort out that sick pay system, then people can't afford to do what's being asked of them when they're supposed to self-isolate. We've also called for a national recovery council and a national skills task force. We believe, and I make no apology for this, I want to be at the table. Our job is to get a fair hearing for working people. But what's more, unions want to be there on equal terms with employers. None of this below stairs. We want we, our ideas, our proposals, which we've set out in great detail, how we can create nearly 2 million new green jobs in technologies and transport, how we can create um, more public service jobs that my goodness me are more desperately needed than ever before. We've set it out in detail. We've shown how we can benefit the parts of the country that need that help most. We want our voice to be heard. So I have to say uh, to everyone, frankly, that decision to scrap ULF is the most bizarre and shocking and perverse uh, political judgment I've heard in a very, very long time. It's a bad decision, as you've already said, Mary, and I won't repeat it. We know Union Learn is value for money. We know we have an impact. We're independently evaluated <laughs> till, you know, we've been independent evaluated with more scrutiny than anybody else. We, we have absolute confidence in what we do. And we know that we reach the parts of the workforce that we hear government talking about all the time. You know, we're supposed to be leveling up. We're supposed to be putting workers first. Well, we know that Union Learn reaches night shift workers, agency workers, part-time workers, low paid workers, blue collar workers who would not dream of going back into a classroom if it were not for their union and who are for the first time getting the literacy, the numeracy, the IT skills that are crucial to getting a decent standard of living through their union. Uh, so yes, I do want to end with this on the Save Union Learn campaign. I want to thank each and every one of you that has got your employer to write in uh, to the Secretary of State for Education, copied to the Chancellor. Um, and we've had such a brilliant response from prisons to rail to manufacturing to retail, uh, all of those letters. We need to keep them coming through. The petition that I see has gone up in the chat box. Let's ramp up those signatures, push it out to each and every branch, please, and get as many people to sign as possible. And lobby, our, um, lobby MPs locally in their constituencies ideally in red wall constituencies. Let them hear the frustration and anger, frankly, of any attempt, any attempt to pull the rug from underneath Union Learn because we know we do a great job. I was due to meet Gavin Williamson on the 5th of November. We just heard, uh, that was gonna be fireworks night, by the way. Uh, we just heard that um, he's now uh, shifted that to the 9th of November, which I will share with you uh, privately, is my birthday. So I am really looking forward to that meeting. 
Um, and the more we can ramp up the pressure in the advance of that meeting, in many ways, a few more days, no bad thing. Let's get those letters out. Let's get those conversations with local MPs. Let's get that petition signed. Um, this government has done so many U-turns, Mary. Frankly, I am dizzied by the U-turns. Let's get one more U-turn. Let's get that decision on union loan reversed. Um, some will say this is a tough task, it's mission impossible, but the trade union movement is famed for succeeding at mission impossible and if we stick together we will win. Thank you. Thank you very much both Francis and Kate. What a fantastic speech Francis and a real call to arms that we must not be defeatist, we must fight for union learn because it's one of the jewels of the trade union movement and it makes so many differences, so much difference to um, workers who don't get any help from anywhere else. The only help that they get at courses below, below level three and level two, the only help they get is through Union Learn. And these are workers who don't get training from anywhere else. I've got one question for both you and Kate. So can we get Kate back onto the um, screen, Yusuf? She, she's, she's there and her mic is unmuted. Great stuff. So I have just one question, which is, uh, for both Kate and Francis. Uh, I know Gavin Williamson better than I would like to know him. Um, and uh, it's clear that um, he doesn't have much understanding of education. He, he says he's very committed to lifelong learning, but this decision is inexplicable. So Francis, you've talked about um, uh, what, you know, the campaign. Francis, I'm interested in what will be your line of um, argument to Gavin Williamson, your key line of argument, uh, you know, just just a summary. And Kate, what can Labour do? What is Labour doing to try to get this decision reversed? Listen, uh, from my perspective, we're trade unionists. There are many times, many of us have experience sat across uh, the table from an employer who needs to be provided with a ladder to climb yeah. down. And I'm not fussy about this. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Um, this isn't a partisan issue. Uh, we've had support from right across the house. We know where our values lie. These are trade union values about equality and justice and decent treatment at work. But yeah. I want to win support from right across the house for that, uh, those values. And because we're really good at what we do, you yes. know, we know we're a quarter of a million workers helped every year. Uh, nobody else can do this. And I want um, the Secretary of State to understand that this is about uh, the good faith I would expect from any decent employer, I would expect from anybody I deal with. If we can prove the case that this is good, not just most importantly for the workers concerned, but for good industrial relations, we've all seen it, uh, the way that we've, even when we are in conflict on pay and conditions, we know that we can have constructive relations with employers on skills and learning and development and that we get that multiplier effect. If we get a collective agreement, we can multiply the number of workers who benefit from this isn't just about, you know, a center with a project yeah. and a few computers. This is about winning agreements that can scale up uh, uh, training and skills and learning opportunities for workers right across the board. So I'm going to put a reasoned case. I'm going to put a political case too with a small p, which is that as far as I'm concerned, this was a breach of good faith. And I want to see that good faith restored. And if there's a willingness to do that, I don't mind. All of us have had to say face in the past. We all know about that as negotiators. But we've got to do the right thing by working people. They must come first. And those who need that support uh, must be first top of the queue for the yeah. help that Union Learn gives. Thank you, Francis. And Kate, um, what, 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 what pressure are the Labour Party trying to exert? 
Yeah, really, really good question, Mary. And I know you feel you know Gavin much better than you'd like to. I'm sure he feels exactly the same about you. Um, and it's great always to see Mary and a formidable uh, challenge to Gavin Williamson um, on so many issues. So um, I'm sure you're making the case about Union Learn when you're speaking to him too. Um, what, would, what would Labour want to do? Obviously, we'll use every parliamentary device that we can, debates, questions, colleagues signing the early day motion. And as Francis says, this isn't necessarily a party political issue entirely. There are allegiances that we can and we will make across the House. We know, for example, the chair of the Select Committee, the Conservative Robert Halfon, has already been raising his concerns. We know that John Hayes, the former skills minister, um, has been a real champion of Union Learn and, and is still a champion of what has been achieved. So of course, we will be um, making the political case and using the political devices, but Francis is right. This isn't something where Labour just needs to be making noise. We need to make sure the government changes its mind. The outcome is really important to working people and to our country as a whole. And I think that's what we've got to get over to Gavin Williamson and to the Chancellor and to the Secretary of State for Business and other senior cabinet members for whom this really matters if they want to achieve their ambitions to level up and, and to um, have Britain make the most of its economic potential. We've got to show Gavin that Union Learn helps him to deliver his own objectives. We've got to show him too, and Francis is right to allude to this, that government does these things better when it works with the trade union movement. You've shown that again and again during this crisis. Let's take the opportunity to show him it on this occasion that government's more effective when it's working with unions, with the union movement, to raise the skills and abilities of working people. That helps him deliver his ambitions. You stand ready to help him do that. Why on earth would he say no? Why on earth would he say no? Indeed. Thank you, Kate. Well, I would like to thank both Kate and Francis for a brilliant start to our Union Learn Conference. Two entirely wonderful, impassioned, uh, speeches full of information and wisdom and knowledge and uh, so I'd like to thank you both for giving up the time to address us today and I hope you have a good day for the rest of the day. Thanks. And now we move on to our panel discussion and it's our first panel discussion of the day and the topic for our panel members is skills and manufacturing and I would like to welcome all the panel members. So first of all Anne Watson, Anne has been the Chief Executive of the, of the Engineerity Group since 2015, and she works strategically with engineering employers to identify and develop solutions to the many skills challenges within the sector. As part of her role, Anne represents employer views to government departments and stakeholders, such as the DfE and the Institute for Apprenticeship, uh, to ensure that skills policy reflects the needs of engineering sector employers. With over 20 years experience in the sector, and has a unique depth and breadth of knowledge. Secondly, I'd like to welcome Tony Burke. Tony is Assistant General Secretary of Unite. He needs no introduction. Uh, and so uh, the union which covers work is in manufacturing, transport, public services, construction, white collar and health in the UK and the Republic of Ireland. And he's been a full-time official since 1990. So Tony, we're looking uh, for that wisdom. You're president of the Industrial Group in Europe and executive committee member of Industrial Global. So, Tony, welcome. And thirdly, I'd like to welcome Dame Judith Hackett. Dame Judith is the chair of the Engineerity Group. She graduated in chemical engineering from Imperial College and is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Chemical Engineers. So welcome to you all. And my first question to the panel is, what would you see as the most added value from a joint approach to skills in the workplace and at a strategic level? You'll we'll each have about three minutes to answer. So I'm going to go in sort of um, the order of introduction. Anne first. Oh, morning, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's really important that there is a, a strategic joined up approach. I think um, having caught the kind of the end of, of Francis's speech, um, I think it's really clear to us all that actually we're in the midst of a skills crisis um, where we're seeing the start of mass unemployment, which is affecting not just um, existing workers, but young people as well, um, probably on a, on a scale that we've not seen since the, the 1980s and could actually be worse. Um, and I think just because of the, the scale of the crisis, it does warrant 
unions, workers, employers, skills bodies like Ingenuity and government coming around the table and working together on this. Um, I think we've got a great opportunity. Um, and as a collection of employers and, and trade unions, we actually did write to, to Gavin Williamson at the end of August, um, asking to work with governments. Um, and a, a big part of that ask was to create a national manufacturing skills task force so that we could get around the table and work strategically around some of these key issues. Because manufacturing is such a diverse sector, but equally we've got a huge amount of talent within it. Um, and I think we've got a great opportunity to come together and really recognize the fact that there will be parts of manufacturing such as food and drink, um, vaccine manufacturing, who we are seeing now have got skills gaps because they're accelerated as a result of COVID, whilst at the same time we're seeing parts of the sector decline um, and shedding staff. And I think one of the great things about, uh, about the sector, which I think gets us all really impassioned, is the talent and the transferable skills within the sector is incredible. And I think what we've got a real opportunity to do by working together is to make sure that we do not lose the talent from the sector. Yeah that we yeah. keep it within the sector and help those individuals perhaps move from automotive into life sciences. But if we get the brains around the table, I think we've got a great opportunity to do that. Thanks, Anne. I mean, a great mix of the talent we have, the talent we must not wait, but also transferable skills and retraining into different sectors. Really interesting. Tony, you're on the panel just to prove that we are not biased against men and that men can speak at a Union Learn conference. So we're really interested to have the first contribution from a man today and it's wonderful it's you Tony. Thank you thank you chair and uh, do my best to answer the question um, it's good to be here uh, because when you read out my CV going back a long long time um, I'm also the trade union representative on the board of Ingenuity and on the board of Cogent which covers the chemicals nuclear and pharmaceutical industry so it's a it's an issue training skills and union learn is very very important to me and it's great working with uh, with Anne and Judith and uh, Justine and Joanna at, uh, at the other se sector skills councils. Why should we work together? Well, if you don't, and we don't go in to government or other uh, political parties and employers on a joint basis, then I found over the years that you don't get very far. I go all the way back to the learning and enterprise councils many years ago when we set up retraining schemes for people who were likely to lose their jobs. This is a long, long time ago, but we found going in with employers uh, and others were able, a, enabled us to be able to make some progress. This crucial time at the moment um, is based around the fact that uh, we are going to lose a lot of jobs in manufacturing. That's, that's very, very clear. And, the idea of setting up the National Skills Task Force came from uh, Anne and other colleagues uh, and Make UK and Unite and the CSEU and the TUC are pleased to be involved. And by coming together and bringing together trade unions, employers, academics and civil society to do this, it's the only way that we'll get some common sense in my view. I think at the moment, very unfortunate, as, as Anne says, Gavin Williamson didn't heed our call initially. So we take it upon ourselves to work together to make sure that he does and recognize that uh, we need to be able to speak with one voice to the government for manufacturing to say what we need to do, not just to establish the National Skills Task Force, but a turn around the economy in the long term. Thank you, Tony. And uh, Judith? Uh, what what can we do to um, you know get the most added value from a strategic and a workplace approach to skills? Well, I would I would echo everything that both Tony and Anne have just said. I think the importance of consistency and a united view being presented to government is is hugely powerful. Actually, um, I not only chair Ingenuity but I also chair uh, Make UK. Uh, and I'm on the board of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. Yeah. I've been trying for several years now to bring industry bodies together to get a consistent voice coming out of industry. And when you add to that the power of the trade union movement and the workforce, it makes it 
doubly powerful. And I think if we're all saying the same thing, yeah. we can get to many more people. I think, again, hearing what was said at the end of those opening speeches, it isn't just the Department for Education we need to be speaking to. We need to get to the Chancellor. We need to get to the Bayes ministers and make these same points. And, and collectively, we can do that and be making that message consistent. Thank you very much. I'm going to change that great answer. And, 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 and that political engagement, it's not just the DfE, it's engagement with the Treasury and with Bayes and with other ministers as well uh, to, to show them the importance of skills development. Uh, my next question, I'm going to change the order. Tony, I'm going to allow you to go first. So what would you say, and I'll come to Judith and I'll come to Anne, what would you say are the biggest challenges in, in manufacturing in the next few months? In, <clears throat> in terms of skills, uh, the the, the, the key issue is going to be the fact that we're going to lose a lot of people in manufacturing who are highly skilled and we need to develop a structure that allows those people to stay in the industry, in manufacturing industry. It may not be doing the same job that they've always done, uh, but it means that they've got basic skills that are transferable. And make no mistake, as I said earlier on, when you've been around a long time, you realize one of the issues that always comes with a, an economic downturn, and of course, a major problem that we've got with COVID, is that they could lead, when we need to have, uh, uh, come out of uh, the crisis, it could lead to having a skill shortage unless we ensure that we've got enough skilled people and people to retrain. I'm talking about people who've already got basic skills to retrain in other areas. It's not difficult. It's not difficult to do. But the government needs to listen to the voice of industry, the unions, and uh, uh, educationalists into what needs to be done to stop uh, a skill shortage, which will surely come if we don't get this right. So I see that as being the big challenge, the fact that there's many, many people who will face unemployment for the first time ever in their lives and they need help and they need signposting. It's not good enough just to talk to somebody on the end of a phone and give them a pamphlet. It's not going to work. We need a proper uh, national skills task force and a proper retraining program. Thanks, Tony. Very powerful. Judith, what would you say are the biggest <laughs> challenges in um uh, uh, what are the biggest skills challenges in manufacturing over the next few months? I think exactly that. Keeping people in the sector, it, for yeah. me, is, is hugely important. It would be a tragedy if at a time when we, even before COVID, we had a skills shortage and a skills crisis in this sector. We cannot recruit enough people into the jobs that were available pre-COVID. If we emerge from this crisis, having lost more of those people, that will make things even worse and hamper our recovery. So for me, keeping people in the sector and enabling them to move from one subsector to another is absolutely crucial. So if we've, we've already invested a lot of money in training people to be competent. And if they then go off and do other unskilled work, they're lost to the sector. So enabling them to move between aerospace or automotive and moving into the sectors that are maintaining their position like food and drink and pharmaceuticals and actually giving them the skills they need and giving them the confidence to recognize that they've already got a large chunk of the skills that are needed and the top up is not that great. Those for me are the big challenges we face. Thanks Judy and Anne. The biggest challenges we face in the next few months in schools and manufacturing. Um, thank you, Mary. Yeah, absolutely agree with, with Tony and, and, and Judith um, in terms of ensuring we keep the, the skills within the sector. Um, I think there's a real positive in terms of the National Manufacturing Skills Task Force. Um, because in my 20 years of working in the sector in skills, this is the first time I've actually seen 16 trade bodies from across the sector, along with the trade unions, come together absolutely aligned in terms of skills and what needs to be done. So I think that's a really big positive. 
But I think also in terms of the sector, as well as looking at what we need to do now to address the, the kind of the skills crisis and the, the potential loss of talent, I think there's also a role for the, the National Manufacturing Skills Task Force to, to do what government's not very good at doing, which is to have a longer term strategy. Because I think although it's really important that we look at retaining talent in the sector, I think we also need to have an eye to the future, which is how do we upskill and reskill people within the sector or those who might be displaced in the sector, ready for the rebound out of COVID. So in terms of digital capabilities, digital skills, the green yeah. agenda. I think we've also got some work to do with young people and their parents because we're now seeing apprentices being made redundant and that's not a great message. So I think there's a piece of work we need to do there as well in the short term to continue to push the fact that an apprenticeship, particularly in engineering and manufacturing, is probably one of the best career routes you, you can have. Um, and then I think finally, it's about actually how do we support the talent within the sector um, and enable them to to, to kind of in, increase their skills. So I think as well as making sure that we don't lose talent from the sector, I think there's an eye to the future as well and having that strategic view about making sure that the sector is fit for the future as well. Thank you. Um, can, one last question for all panel members. So I'm going to start with uh, Judith, then move to Anne, then finish with Tony, and this will be the final question. And I'm glad you mentioned apprenticeships, Anne. Um, you know, what, one change would enable employers to take on more apprentices and to keep the apprentices that they've got. So Anne, then Judith, and then Tony. Thank you, Mary. Um, I, th I think for for me, I think that one of the biggest changes that um, could be made is, is around the, I guess, the financial contribution to support employers at this time. Um, we did see um, in August the measures that were announced by the Chancellor around the kickstart scheme, traineeships, some incentives for employers to recruit apprentices, and that was all very welcome. But if you consider the, um, I guess, the financial contribution that employers make in the manufacturing sector to an apprenticeship, it can cost them somewhere between 80 to over £100,000 to train an apprentice. So offering employers £1,500, £2,500, is not is, is not a great motivation given the difficult times we're working to. So I really think it's a mix of either increasing those incentives, um, or as I've been speaking to some colleagues within DFA about actually supporting apprentices' wages and salaries. Um, yeah. That would encourage, um, particularly SME employers. Um, to recruit an apprentice, it would also give them that motivation to actually keep the apprentices in work as well. Thank you, Anne. Judith? I think I, I, I agree with that. I think it's about support for employers to retain apprentices. I think we, we need to take this issue of employers making apprentices redundant very, very seriously indeed, because this isn't just a turn off for those individuals, but at a time when we already know it's a challenge to attract, attract people into uh, careers with a STEM based and, and, and get them onto manufacturing and engineering apprentices in the first place, it will put off people for generations if they see the current cohort being made redundant from our sector. So it's really, really important that we get support for those who are already part of the system to enable them to stay in work and complete their apprentices, because that's what will act as an encouragement to those who will come along in the years to come. Absolutely. And Tony, last but not least. Uh, th th thanks, Chair. Just to um, comment there on what Judith has said, that's one of the key issues. We set up this uh, network of, uh, of employers, sector skills councils and unions on the basis of the, of the problem we were going to have with apprentices being made redundant. And the government came back uh, pre pretty quietly and said, oh, well, we'll, we'll provide uh, uh, assistance to apprentices who have only got their last, I think it was the last three months. We're talking about something much more serious than that. We're talking about those apprentices who are currently in training and not yet completed their training and got their skills that they should be kept on uh, there's no reason at all why they can't do that they can use the apprenticeship levy we've made proposals and it's no good to go the government uh, faffing around with small uh, items they really need to grasp this but the other key issue and i totally agree with 
what Anne uh, and Judith has said. And this is why we need joined up thinking. The unions and the employers and the sector skills councils are at one. To train an apprentice in engineering, in aerospace, in autos, in a number of other areas as well, costs between 80 to 100,000 pound over the period of time. This small amount of money that's being made available uh, by the Chancellor is just not anywhere uh, near enough. They need, employers are going to need assistance uh, for uh, salaries for some time to come. And on top of that, in the long run, when we come out the other side, we really do need a proper uh, structure similar to Germany that provides support for young people to go into apprenticeships because if this goes badly wrong, all the work we've done in trying to persuade parents and educationalists to point young people uh, down the road of an apprenticeship rather than go somewhere else will be lost. Uh, they do it in other countries. Being an apprentice in Germany in a skilled job is something to behold, and I think we should do the same in the UK. Uh, thanks, Tony. Very powerful. I'd really like to thank the panel. I think that um, we have, you know, if the government wants to protect the apprenticeship brand, then it's going to have to do something about keeping apprentices in work. Um, I think there are big challenges uh, around um, the uh, gender divide in apprentices yeah. and, and particularly in manufacturing apprentices and making sure that girls and women can go into manufacturing, that they're not just confined to the low paid social care and health and beauty sector. Oh, that's important, that's important work, but we need to look at that. And, and if the government is going to do a levelling up agenda and uh, really going to uh, make good on its promises in, in uh, northern cities and towns, then this is something the brand has to be protected. So I do wish you every success in your work and thank you very much for being part of our panel today. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. And I'll just turn my phone on silent when I've got a moment. So now we come, one of our best, best parts of any Union Learn conference, because Union Learn is about the Union Learn reps, and we're coming to our awards. And uh, so we want we present the awards to showcase what Union Learning reps do throughout the year to change people's lives with Union Learning. Now, actually, due to the current climate, we simply were unable to film the individual winners. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out each award winner and a short description of why they've won their award. And then for those that have agreed to do so, we will invite them on screen to hold up their trophies and to smile. Some smiles would be really useful in these dark and uh, you know uh, gloomy times. So our first award goes to Community Union Learning Rep, Imran, Iran Farin. So Iran has been supporting learners with literacy needs. Uh, Iran completed her TUC stage one um, um, and became the first, sorry, I'll start out. So Iran started, completed her TUC stage one ULR course and became the union's first ULR in a community setting working at Shipshape in Sheffield um, and working with some of the most vulnerable members of the community the, whose clientele is from a diverse cultural background. Community Union began working with Shipshape in 2018, and Iran played a vital role to help clients access learning uh, through learning opportunities. And by 2019, the Shipshape Community Learning Hub was set up with the help of the ULF. Iran is the main lead for running the Learning Hub and conducting a learning survey, which recognized the need for learning English. She played a key role in working with Community Union and training providers to facilitate and provide access to English learning to unrepresented groups. Iran, what a wonderful job you have done. Thank well you so done. Much. Um, I would like to start thanking everyone for the ULR Award. Uh, this has been a massive achievement uh, for Shipshape and our learners. It's been a great opportunity to be able to work in partnership to bring community learning into a community setting. Over the last two years, we've been able to embed learning at grassroots level to those individuals who have missed out on learning and those who weren't given the opportunity due to multiple reasons such as mental health, long-term health conditions, yeah. and people who lack um, in confidence. So moving forward, we are planning our learning hope to stay local and be able to continue. 
so that we can ensure more communities are given the opportunity to step into learning. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Iram, and thank you for your smile as well. It's lovely. If you just hold yeah. up your award, so let's... Fantastic. Wonderful. If anyone wants to take photographs of the still for that, that's great. Iram, it's been lovely thank to speak so with much. you. Thank you. So the second award goes to Unite the Union, uh, ULR, Julie Butterfield, for supporting learners with numeracy needs. Julie's proudest achievement in the learning and skills field is establishing a joint learning agreement and the establishment of a learning centre at Leeds City Council, which is open five days a week and offers a really wide range of courses, including maths and English. It's been running for over five years with over 100 learners in each subject. Julie has been successful in gaining release for individuals working at Leeds Building Services, even though the depot is being remodelled. Julie has worked with the management team and other reps in the department to highlight any skills gaps and the aspirations of the individuals in that department. The main want and need was identified as a better understanding of maths. Following this, Julie worked with department managers and heads of service to identify the best times and days to release those who expressed an interest, as well as support, securing commitment for them to provide a room to deliver the classes. Julie, what fantastic work, well done. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to thank Chris Muscroft and Jill Pearson from Unite for all the support they've given me, as well as all my wonderful guides up at the building agency who, <clears throat> At certain ages, you don't really want to go back to learning, but they all attended classes. They were there every single week. They did the homework and they all got the level two qualifications, even though we were going into lockdown. So it's this award is not for me. It's for all them guys out there. Thank you. Well, it's for you as well. And Julie, can you move over a bit and hold up the award? Move, move more That's it. That's <laughs> it. So for any photographs that want to be taken. Well, gosh, don't the awards look lovely as well? Really great. Congratulations and well done for your magnificent contribution, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. The next award goes to USDOR ULR, Shirley Smith, for supporting apprenticeships. Shirley has been able to help apprenticeship programmes succeed in her own store, Tesco, in Thirsk. Uh, Thirsk, I know it well. I used to live in North Yorkshire. Shirley had been a trainer and assessor for four years under the old style apprenticeship scheme and so was interested when the new scheme was announced to offer her help and expertise. Shirley spent time with all the candidates on a one-to-one -one basis, helping them through their coursework. This was very helpful to them, but also to Shirley, who learned a lot about how to best to support apprentices. The role of the ULR is vital in the apprenticeship scheme and evident at Shirley's store, as no one has dropped out. My goodness, that's amazing, no dropouts. And dedicated ULRs like Shirley show the way forward to apprenticeship success. Shirley, congratulations. It's magnificent achievement. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank everybody at Door for the help and support I've had, especially Martin Warwick and Tracy White. And thank you. Great. Hold oh, another lovely photograph. Give your all your friends and colleagues a chance to, to show you looking beautiful with the with your absolutely fantastic award. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we now have an award that goes to Unison ULR, Gemma Smith, for supporting learners with digital needs. Over her last six years as a Unison ULR, working at Northumbria NHS Foundation Trust, she has helped thousands of learners gain skills in many different areas. Gemma has always keenly promoted the Trust's IT training courses through her roadshows and bulletins but recognise that some of her learners found it difficult to get uh, to their IT training centre due to their location or their work or family uh, commitments. She has used Learn My Way to offer a range of courses specifically designed to help learners get started with computers and the internet. Gemma, I, uh, I know you're not here in person, but uh, I could probably benefit from that. And Gemma feels very passionate about digital skills because it's not only going to help her colleagues in their jobs, and in their everyday lives, but it's also going to give their families a better start in life too. And we have a lovely photograph of there uh, with Gemma accepting her award. So well done to her. The next award goes to POA ULR, Beverly Nolka, who has won the new category added in due, uh, due to the pandemic, and that's supporting learning at home. Bev has always supported learners above and beyond, but during the COVID pandemic, 
her abilities have shone through, having a huge impact on, um, on both her learners and colleagues at POA Learning. She has adapted very quickly to the changing face of learner support and has ensured that all her colleagues become more innovative along the way. She's been a firm advocate of Zoom and online learning, supporting all her colleagues in how to run Zoom webinars. ADHD is a passion for Bev and she currently runs webinar sessions who previously ran the face to face, but now they run through webinar sessions and on Zoom uh, on the subject of ADHD awareness. So Beverly. There you are, looking great. Thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to thank um, Alison Mannion, our program manager, our project manager, and Gareth, Gareth Williams, our uh, national coordinator, as well as the entire POA learning team. They've been open to any and all of my crazy ideas, as particularly over COVID. Um, and um, it's just been amazing. And over the last 10 years, I've learned so much um, about union learning and hope that Gavin Williamson sees the light on Francis's birthday um, so that this can continue for many more years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. So hold up your award, Beth. Great stuff. <laughs> photographs for those who want to take a photograph on screen. Great photograph. <laughs> Lovely smile. And well Thanks, done. Mary. Fantastic achievement. The next award goes to BFAWU ULR, Fiorica Sequier. And if she comes on screen, she can uh, uh, correct me about my pronunciation because I'm sure that's wrong. And uh, Vicoria, Fiorica. Fiorica has supported disadvantaged learners. Her proudest moment has been the setting up of English taster courses at the Green Core Depot in Northampton, where she works. With the support of a BFAWU project worker, she has put on a six week taster course and then uh, directed uh, workers onto courses the company was putting on. She started with the first learn six learners at the first session, which had doubled by the end of six weeks. She's even put together an exam to see how much learning the students have retained. Fantastic. Can you just, Corey, what, how, do you, how do you pronounce your first name? Tell me. Oh, you're on mute. Can you set yourself off mute? Yes, you're on. Uh, I am Viorica Secrier and I want to thank uh, uh, all the um, team that helped me and supported me for uh, receiving the award. Thank you very much. And can you now hold up your award? Yeah, Fantastic. And let's take a take the so you, we can take the photographs as well. Thank you so much. That's a magnificent achievement. Thank you. Thank you for being with us uh, today. The final award is for supporting older workers and the winner of this category is Karen Kelly from PCS. Unfortunately, Karen passed away early this year at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, but with her lifelong service that she gave as a union learning rep, we felt this was a perfect way of honouring her memory. Karen was an integral part of the union learning rep team, full of ideas and motivation and organizing many learning events during her time as a ULR. One of her many achievements in the branch, which recently included setting up a branch mental health first aiders team and arranging bespoke refresher courses was one of her proudest moments. Karen spotted a learning gap affecting older members and used existing learning sources to tailor understanding pension courses to the needs of her members. Karen saw learning as a great leveler and a way to open up opportunities for others, giving them an opportunity which otherwise would have been denied to them. And I think we'll just have a moment's silence to remember Karen. Thank you. So I want to congratulate everyone who has received one of the ULR awards today. And um, now I think we had the, the video of DHL and Usdor uh, previously, or I may be wrong. Um, so we may have a video of DHL and Usdor, or we may have a video of um, apprentices working at DHL Sainsbury Warehouse in Stoke-on-Trent and the support that they've received from the Usdor and their ULRs. 
Uh, I don't that was, quite... the, that was the video that we showed earlier, Mary, so you can so, move to Stephen now. Right, we're moving to Stephen. Okay, so thank you very much. And congratulations again to all the ULR awards winners this year. So now I would like to introduce Stephen, introduce Stephen Evans to the screen. Stephen has been Chief Executive since 2016, having spent two years previously as Deputy Chief Executive. He joined from Working Links, where he led on policy, strategy and business development. Prior to this, he worked for the London Development Agency as Director of Employment and Skills, commissioning programmes and leading the work of the London Skills and Employment Board. He was a Chief Economist at the Social Market Foundation and spent six years as Senior Policy Advisor in the Treasury, working on policy for skills, productivity and child poverty. Stephen, in my notes, I don't have your current role. So when you start, perhaps you would introduce yourself and what it is your current role. But we're delighted to have you here at the conference. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, you've got all the history and not, not the, not the yeah. current thing. Um, so, yes, I'm the Chief Executive of the Learning and Work Institute. And thanks for inviting me along. And um, it was fantastic to hear all of those um, award winners, really inspiring set of um, stories and achievements and quite a tough act um, to follow. So I'm not, I don't think I'm going to manage to quite follow follow that. But congratulations to all of those award winners. They're brilliant. Um, brilliant uh, examples um, and brilliant examples really of the power of union learn and union learning in general um, and so uh, I was really pleased to add my uh, voice and name to the long and uh, illustrious list of um, people and organisations asking the government to think again about uh, uh, what it's doing around funding for, for union learn. I think it's really important, does an amazing job and those award winners are perfect examples of that and so long may it um, you and I in the Learning and Work Institute are really pleased to continue to support um, Union Learn and Union Learning reps in all that you do. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, Lifelong Learning Week, which is uh, we're on day two of Lifelong Learning Week. It's the first time we've we've uh, we've ever done it, um, and it's intended to try and provide a bit of a focus to celebrate all the um, amazing work that goes on on lifelong learning and try and inspire more adults to learn. So it's kind of very fortuitous that uh, uh, you're holding this uh, this conference um, today. Um, I'd like to say it was all pre-planned, but I think that would uh, be an exaggeration. Um, but it's worked out very, very well and very nicely. And actually, it's a kind of very awards focused day for me today because I've, I've heard all of those um, uh, awards that you've just uh, given out. And we're doing our own Festival of Learning Adult Learning Awards this evening. Um, so you're welcome to, to, to sign up and to, to tune in. Um, the, the details are all on the uh, Festival of Learning website, which uh, quick plug festivalofleaning.org.uk. Um, so that starts at 6 p.m. Um, this evening. So it's a very awards focused day for me, which is always quite an uplifting day, particularly as we await the latest uh, lockdown um, in England. So a bit of celebration and good news is always, always good, isn't it? Um, and I guess actually the award winners <laughs> That you've just talked about and the debates uh, that you've had during the course of this um, conference really illustrate why we wanted to organise Lifelong Learning Week really. Um, we know that lifelong learning is really crucial, it has so many benefits um, and we've heard about some of those already. Um, so people often talk about jobs and careers and how learning can help there and um, how longer working lives mean we need to retrain and update our skills and we've all seen that in our, in our jobs. Uh, most recently, um, I'm amazed I managed to unmute myself there. I've kind of learnt how to use Zoom, but not necessarily always how to unmute my, myself. So um, on, online learning there for me. Um, but beyond jobs and careers, actually, there's so many benefits to learning for health, well-being, citizenship, community, just personal interest, so many, so many more things. And, and learning courses and qualifications, really, really valuable, really important. But actually, we know that learning is about so much more than that. We've uh, been doing all kinds of uh, learning informally and between us and by YouTube videos and all kinds of stuff um, over the course of, of this year. So, so we, we were trying to think about learning in that broadest sense and the broad set of benefits that uh, learning of all kinds can have. Um, and yesterday, to mark the start of Lifelong Learning Week, uh, we published um, a report which um, we, we've been surveying adults for about 28 years, I think, um, to look at how many adults are taking part in some form of learning, that broadly defined learning, um, and why they do and why they don't. Um, so it's the longest running survey of its kind. 
And this year, um, we took a specific look at learning during lockdown. Um, and in fact, we had an event yesterday called Learning After Lockdown, which we, we kind of come up with the title before the second lockdown got announced. So the world had moved on somewhat. Um, but what we found was, was really interesting. So um, about 40% of the population, so not far off half, took part in some form of, of lockdown learning. So that's oh. higher um, than, than actually we've seen in previous years without the impact of the, the virus. And um, so it's great. Loads of it, as you would expect, was online. Lots of it was informal. So it was things like learning how to use Zoom or um, doing the online fitness classes to shake off the pounds that we gained with uh, the homemade banana bread we'd all learned to make and those sorts of things. So all kinds of learning, uh, doing it online. And the great thing I think about learning and we picked up in the survey is that it's really addictive. So once you start doing it, you really get into it and I think 90% of those who'd taken part in learning said they were they were up for doing some more. The problem is not enough people get into it in the first place um, and that's what Union Learn and others are so so great at doing. Um, so we found big inequalities by class um, and by region and by income and all of those sorts of things and a real missed opportunity for me um, furloughed workers so nine million people were furloughed at some point during the first lockdown uh, furloughed workers less likely to take part in learning um, than people who carried on uh, with with their jobs. So that feels to me like a missed opportunity and we'd like to see the government do a bit more as we head into this um, second lockdown to um, open up opportunities for people who are furloughed. Um, so lots of interest in learning. Once you get into it, you want to do more, but big inequalities in access and I'm sure that won't come as a surprise to lots of you. And that's really the point of Lifelong Learning Week, to try and celebrate all those amazing benefits of learning and some of those benefits that you've heard from before, to try and say, well, how can we get more adults in, into learning? How can we inspire more adults to learn? How can we make the policy and the funding uh, work a bit better? And so loads of stuff going on during the course of the week, lots of debates, as I say, the awards this evening, uh, lots of um, online lectures and classes to give people different ways to to get into learning and I think the key message for me is that we want to make the 2020s a decade of renewal for lifelong learning after a decade of cuts um, and that requires all of us to work together to showcase the great stuff that's going on there's some amazing learning going on amazing work going on across the country um, but we need more we need change we need investment after a decade as I say of cuts so we're really keen to work with all of the union learning movement and to work in partnership with you all and to celebrate the amazing stuff that you're doing as well. I hope that the Learning and Work Institute can play our part in all of that. And I hope that Lifelong Learning Week uh, can be the start of that too. So really open for lots of ideas and debates and discussions and just for some joint working to celebrate learning and get more adults into learning. Stephen, that was really fantastic. And thank you for... Um you know, give us an introduction to the work of the Learning Work Institute and to Lifelong Learning Week. And uh, we, we will obviously be keen to work with you and to work on those missed opportunities which you've identified um, so, you know, very powerfully in your speech, particularly the fact that so many people did engage with informal learning. And we know that, you know, people despise, that, that people don't give informal learning the credit uh, and the importance that it has because we know in union learning that if workers or adults are um if they didn't have a good time at school and let's be clear i, I was a teacher and a teacher trainer but i know that many workers did not have a good time at school they're more likely to leave without the qualifications they need and uh that has huge you know that has huge consequences for their lives both you know both um, their working lives but also their personal lives and also their physical health and um, we know that informal learning is often the way that you get it's, it's something that people want to do they don't find it threatening it's something they want to learn and it's through informal learning that you can start people on a learning journey start workers on a learning journey particularly those workers who are the most uh, need of developing a whole range of skills so that's great to hear of your work. And um, what's the webinar tonight? What, what's, what, tell, tell us again what the... Uh... 
Yeah, so, so this evening uh, we've got our Festival of Learning Awards. So we do adult learning awards every year. There's, I've seen the videos, so I've kind of got tissues at the ready because they're, they're an amazing set of stories. So yeah, you can tune in from six o'clock to 7.30, I think it is. And the sign up is all on the Festival of Learning uh, website. So please do uh, come along and have a celebration of lifelong learning. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure many of us will take you up on that offer. Thank you, Stephen. And now we move to our second panel discussion of the day. And the topic for our panel members is Union Learning Reps, Lockdown and Beyond. And I'd like to welcome our panel members here today. The five man panel members are Sean Dixon from Usdorf, Linda Slazer from Unison, Mark Dickens from BFAWU, John Goodwin from Usdorf, and Gillian Nixon from Unison. So can we welcome our panel onto the great stuff and get them on camera? Lisa's doing a great job behind the scenes. This is really, this is really pressured stuff doing all of this. So we can see Sean, we can see Gillian. Linda, can you put your camera on? Can see John? Just... Linda, yeah, Linda, if you put your camera, that's yeah. great. On. Good Lord, we've managed to get everybody onto the panel. And if Sean, Mark, and John, uh, when 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 I ask the questions to you, if you'll be ready to unmute, because at the moment you're muted, you don't have to unmute now. But when when I do ask the question, so it's absolutely fantastic to have this panel of Union Learning reps at the Union Learn Conference for you all to be attending digitally. I'm just delighted uh, to see you all and uh, to thank you for the fantastic work that you're doing, supporting your colleagues in their learning and their development at work. So um, the first question is, uh, what have you been doing to help your members during the lockdown period? And we're going to start, I'll do it clockwise, and then the next question I'll do anti-clockwise. So Sean, you can start, what have you been doing uh, to help your members during the lockdown period? And if you unmute yourself, then we'll be able to hear you. Great. Um... Uh, I think my my answer is going to be a bit different to other panelists today. So we were most of the way through our redundancy notice period where I, where I was working um, in the first lockdown in March. So our support took a larger rep team twist for sites you allow us. Um, job centre, company resourcing and other support options that were being put in place stopped. So there were no more visits to site, no job fairs or redundancy support. Uh, all this had started drying up before the lockdown was announced as well. So I adapted some of the redundancy resources that were available from USDOR and other outside agencies, uh, chopping up and expanding on USDOR's job hunting guide into three two-hour workshops that helped cover job hunting CV and interviews because we'd done a, a support needed survey and length of service that people had had, um, it were eight, nine years average. Um, we also ran workshops on in, Indeed and LinkedIn, which I was learning about um, because of their job support, uh, their job search functions, networking and CV building. Um, extra stuff, well, we, we've done some work with Royal Literary Fund around literacy and writing skills and Claire Shaw and Mary Carlson offered 12 staff with CVs, uh, which we did in a um, controlled social distance environment uh, for the company. And it also led on to some one-to-one -one sessions. Um, used computers in, in, in learning centre for job hunting. Um, but then when members weren't there, um, so if they were on sick or isolated or shielding, the entire rep team were, were, were keeping in contact with them where we had uh, contact details. So one of mine that I had, it, it, it got some mental health issues, spoke to me at warehouse before I were off and I was just available 24 seven for him. So, but th this highlights how ULF worked to support our members at the lowest point. I mean, that's really interesting, Sean, because obviously going through redundancy, that's not a position that anybody wants to be in and it's a very, very difficult time. But the work yeah. that we did in supporting members in applying for jobs, in you know writing CVs, in employment skills, you know, it's not a position you want to be in. But actually, the work you do becomes ever more vital. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the only thing that we had to do as a rep team uh, were make sure that we looked after ourselves because I think halfway through we suddenly realised that we'd not actually done anything for ourselves. So yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So thank you. So Gillian, thank you for that. We'll come back at Gillian. Um, you know, what have, what have you been doing to help your members during the lockdown period? Well, I was one of the first um, sent home. So we were sent home almost immediately on lockdown. So that took a little bit of accustoming myself to. Um, it took a, a couple of weeks to get my, my own head round everything um, in all fairness. Um, but then it, it sort of became aware to me that one of the things that was happening was that parents were really panicking about how to look after the children, how to teach the children, what they could do with the children with all this extra time. So one of the first things that uh, myself and a friend did was create a website where people could post um, links to free learning. Um, it, it, soon, and it soon became obvious that there were lots of other people looking at that website. So we started adding links for adult learning and, and, and things like that. And obviously I added a lot of the resources that I use as um, a ULR. So once I got myself settled in at home and, um, and into a routine, I started using branch social media, um, making sure that people knew where I was and how to contact me. Uh, luckily, we, our branch very quickly got set up because we were virtually thrown out of our office um, on, on the council premise as well. So yeah, even our branch has been working um, from home all this time and still is, we're not allowed to go back in to our office um, as yet. Um, so, but I've been sending out regular emails, um, using all the links that we've got from region and also national, making sure that people are aware of all the, the opportunities. Um, it very, also very quickly became obvious that, you know, we were going to be working from home for a long time and possibly um, well into the future as well. So I started looking at how to create online content from the courses that we, we already did. Um, it, it seems as though this has changed employers or certainly my employers attitude a little bit um, and we also started talking with the employer about creating a learning agreement, something which I've been in a way for, for quite a while. Um, so I'm still currently um, with that as well. Um, I must say my of learning, so I wanted to make it a formal agreement. So. Um, we also just created a questionnaire um, because then I want to see how people's attitudes have changed to learning, um, you know, to see if the pandemic has changed their minds. And so I'm looking forward to the results of, of that. Thank you very much. And you're absolutely right to focus on that learning agreement. We know that, um, you know, we know that workplaces with learning agreements, the more learning goes on, the, the staff are more productive, there's better uh, relationships with management and with the employers. So that's a really great thing to focus on. And I'm sure when you are directing people to how do you support your children learning, you went to the NEU website because we, we had a website dedicated to parents and helping them support their children's learning. But if you didn't, you can do that for next time. So that's absolutely great. I'd like to turn to Mark now. Yes, good morning. Um, yeah, I'm Mark from uh, Fox's Biscuits Batley. And uh, would you believe I'm actually speaking from our uh, learning union learner headquarters in Barnsley. Uh, first time here, a um, lot of history. Uh, we also share with the NUM. So uh, I'd love to take you around and actually show you because amazing place. But what have I done over the last eight months? It's been very difficult for us because um, usually we would have um, two or three courses a year, whether it be English, IT, uh, mental awareness, etc. So I haven't been able to do that. And we do have quite an aging population at Fox's Biscuits Batley. So it's very difficult to engage and motivate my staff to further learning. Um, so that's taken some time to do. And with us having now the lockdown, I've uh, almost got to start from the beginning again. But uh, what I have been doing is we have a number of notice boards. I put up uh, a number of sort of online sort of distance learning courses, uh, whether that be do with mental awareness, letter writing, it could be anything, English. And to actually get people on board with that is I have an open door policy, basically. Anybody can come in, uh, concentrate a lot on the learning. I, I don't know if anybody knows, but we were recently taken over by a big organization for Aero Roche, basically. So uh, there has been a lot of work in that respect. Now, looking at Ferrero, they're heavy into the learning side with their staff. They own Thornton's, um, Tic Tac, a number of big organizations, and they seem to be friendly towards the learning side. And so I'm 
waiting for some uh, meetings with them to see where I can push that and move forward there. But to, I say it's a, a difficult time as well to re-motivate people because with the COVID situation as well, people are looking at other things and they're not really interested in, you know, actually pushing forward. So trying to get people on board has been difficult this year. But uh, yeah, I, um, I make sure people are aware of the, um, the distance learning, make sure we've got e-note uh, courses, distance learning courses, online courses. I mean, you can even uh, log into the government site of Government UK um, Education, and there are plenty of um, sort of uh, free education there also. And trying to people push people forward, taking names down for the future, saying hopefully in the new year, uh, we will have you know uni new learning possibilities. Uh, we have a great uh, uh, learning department with computers, which unfortunately I haven't been able to use recently. I've shut that office off because of COVID. But once that reopens, uh, I'm hoping to sort of get people back on board there. But it's, uh, it's, it's basically keeping it promoted and keeping people aware that in the future, we are going to be back with it. So uh, yeah. stay with me and we'll soon be back on board. Signposting for the future. Linda, yeah. what have you been doing? Uh, good morning. Um, I'm on full time release um, to Newcastle City branch. Um, working very closely with Newcastle City Council employer. We have actually got an exceptional good relationship with them. Um, I lead on six learning zones that are dotted around the authority, traditionally in likes of, um, you know, areas where staff are not obviously office based, that, you know, the environmental staff, they're the gardeners, they're the cleaners, uh, they're the care at home staff. So traditionally, I am out every morning, every afternoon at a different learning zone across the authority five days a week. That stopped in March, as you could well imagine. Mm. The rooms are traditionally quite small rooms with up to about five PCs in. So obviously to keep me and other members of staff safe, they were all closed down. Um, so I had to think, how the hell am I going to get learning across to people and keep the project highlighted and everything? So I went virtual. So I promoted it on our social media, through our regional office, um, letting them know that the project was still very much here for people. It's been absolutely amazing. Staff are still engaging. Um, I think luckily, because I have been on a project a long time, I've got a real good connection with a lot of the staff. Um, so they've needed me because all of a sudden, their employer is now making their main contact through Teams on a handheld machine. That they've never done before so it's all of that constant just keep chatting to staff and letting them know that I'm around my phone's on you know every day for them to contact us so it's still very much being used and mm -hmm. um, I think just liaising I actually what I did some figures and um, because obviously the threat to the ULM funding which is you know maddening and um, I've actually over the, the the year or so that I've been on the project I've got 287 individuals who use the learning zones and yeah. that is totaled up to over 3,600 visits to the learning zones. So just putting those figures together actually knows that, you know, it proves that the ULF funding is vital to keep this yeah. learning within the, within the employer. Fortunately, um, I had a lot of IT equipment through the ULF funding and every bit of that now was out on loan to members who were either working from home or having to do some distance learning. So it's great that we've had this equipment there and it's all out on loan. Um, also, um, you know, following up with the support, people realizing, oh my God, I need to talk to somebody and it's just being on the other end of the phone. And I'm just so fortunate that I have got that good relationship with staff. Um, identifying the learning needs all of a sudden it's like my god I have got to do a COVID you know and um, before I come back to work I've got to complete this eight this I learning through my employer before I go back to the workplace talking people through that me accessing it and completing it myself because I actually work for the council I'm just on release to unison and um, so I'm just being able to be there for them and let them know that the zone is around I think social media has been the biggest tool for us up in Newcastle. Everything we do, we'll get on Facebook, we'll get on Instagram, and we've got a great way of just keeping connected with people. 
and also uh, have weekly meetings with a member of the management team from the employer, Newcastle City Council, and with a branch education coordinator, so that we can, you know, say, right, what's best to do next? How can we move this on? What are the staff are needing? What's the members needing? So, yeah, different times, very strange, but we've managed to keep it going, so which is which is great news, yeah. Fantastic, Linda. I mean, I, I, you know, before this, uh, before the first lockdown, I hadn't used Teams. Um, I hadn't used Zoom, <laughs> um, you know, and, um, you know, the world is transformed. The world is absolutely transformed. And one of the things it's done for the NEU is bring us kicking and screaming into the 20th century. We had one Zoom meeting in May, which had 20,000 members online. We think it's the biggest ever Zoom meeting because Boris Johnson has said, you, you know, you have to go back to work in school at a time of a high incidence of the virus in schools which are not COVID secure, they still aren't. And um, it just shows you that actually new ways of communication can mean you go beyond the branch meeting and you go beyond the normal people are just always there and it becomes more accessible and it becomes more interactive, you know, um, uh, running it with questions from members and, and, and so on. So, you know, these are very strange times, but one benefit that may come out of them, very strange and very difficult times, and no one wants to go through them, but one benefit that may come out is we learn as a union movement that we can work in new ways and ways which may be much more accessible, particularly for women with caring responsibilities who are not going to go to a branch meeting at the end of the shift, are not going to go out at 7.30 to a pub. You know, this is new ways and more inclusive ways of working. And finally, but last but certainly not least, John, you were in the video, weren't you, um, earlier? I was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, I was. So, the fantastic work. So tell us what you've been doing during lockdown. Okay, so what we've done is the Learning Centre remained open during most of the full lockdown. However, we worked with the company to introduce a safe working environment. So this included social distancing, appropriate cleaning equipment and briefings for people to follow. We all have struggled with our usual provider delivering courses in the normal way through the learning centre. Although visitors were still allowed on site, the FE College we were, could not adapt to their teaching practices to meet the learners. So new social distancing meant that there were fewer people in the learning centre due to capacity that the college could not deliver for the lesson number in the class. But this never stops us, though we have sourced a new distance learning provision with Shrewsbury College and we're now delivering our functional skills programme along with our level two courses. We continue to promote learning and have recently delivered a very successful Get Online Week campaign in October. So in October, when it was Get Online Week, we promoted digital skills, we've done functional skills, apprenticeships, IT. Over two shifts so far, we've recruited 30 members to oh. sign up for the courses. Fantastic, wonderful stuff, and great to see you in person on the film as well, and see your depot and see what you're actually doing. It's really fantastic. So um, we've only got about eight minutes left, so we're going to have to be fairly brief in our answers uh, for uh, the next round. But I do want to hear everyone's got about two minutes. What are your plans for the next twelve to eighteen months, particularly at a time when we know there are going to be more redundancies on the horizon? Sean's already talked about the work he, he's done, the valuable work he's done. So I'm not going to start with you, Sean. I'm going to go. In a different order this time, I'll go with um, Linda first, then Mark, then Gillian, then Sean, and then John again to round us off. So, Linda. Hi. Um, right. Well, it's going to be very difficult, isn't it? There is going to be job cuts. There is going to be such a need for upskilling. I mean, I've already done a lot of work in this within the learning zones anyway. I, I, you know, the figures of people retraining and moving around within the local authority has been outstanding over the last couple of years. Um, so I think using the Unison Moving On booklet, which is one of the best tools that I've ever used in supporting staff in gaining, you know, those interview skills, you know, realising that actually every job they're going to have to apply for, if that's the case, has to be done digital. So the need to be registered to job sites. In Newcastle, it's Northeast Jobs. If you apply for a job within Newcastle City Council, you have to be registered to Northeast Jobs to access the, you know, the, the, the learning, the, the application. Staff, sometimes traditionally in local authorities, work for the same employer for like 30 plus years. 
They've made, yeah. have never had an interview. So just building the confidence up for people is going to be a huge, huge task over the next few months. So I think just making sure that we'll have some kind of workshops going, hopefully we will be back in the workplace, we'll be back in the learning zones and we'll be able to get things up and going. Um, interview skills, people are terrified, absolutely terrified of going into an interview because they may never have had one. It may have already been an informal chat with their exits and employer and they've moved into a different role. But I think that's going to be a huge, huge thing in the, the future. So the moving on booklet that Unison has is, is just an excellent tool that we will be needing. Um, you know, I've been actually attending, taking my time, attending as many webinars myself through the ULF, you know, and through LEOS um, to, to build my skills up because I'm going to need to keep my skills up to date for to be able to support the members to moving on. And um, hopefully, you know, I am trying to get a bigger learning zone open in our civic centre so staff will be able to come into. Um, there's a big drive for the employer to have everybody on a digital payslip. Now, there is 700 mm -hmm. outstanding members of staff do not they have the paper payslip still and they want to hang on to it, but they're not yeah. going to be able to. So I'm hoping that the Civic Centre Learning Zone, which is going to be in a bigger space, I've just completed a risk assessment so that I'm safe and members will be able to be safe and the staff will be safe. So hopefully that will happen in the, sometime next year. <laughs> um, yeah. And quickly now, Linda, just mm -hmm. finishing up. Yeah, and just making sure that, you know, what I identify, what learning they need to be able yeah. to move on and keeping an, right. you know, keeping that close eye there. Fantastic. Really big plans uh, for and really rooted in what the members need. Thank you. Sean, I'm going to you next. I've changed my mind on the order. Just to keep you on your toes. <laughs> I love me on myself. But, um, so with our site close, closing already, the help of the members due to redundancies questions already happened to us. So uh, for me, and my work as a ULR networking was is and always continues to be the, the most important thing so I'm in contact even though we've left the business because it was a site closure um, with ex-colleagues and members to highlight any vacancies uh, that I come across while I'm searching uh, highlight any learning opportunities that I come across because I'm normally found on Twitter somewhere uh, promoters does online learning gateway uh, and I'm continuing to run the old learning centre social media on Twitter. Um, I've been continuing my support of the Usdar Learning Centre at Tesco Distribution Goal, especially its new coordinator, Keith, who I, that I were working with before. Uh, trialling some online platforms for Usdar Learning, who are trying to find me a company to join so they could suck on me out. Uh, so Anne and Martin have been wonderful in their support for me. Um, also, quite active on social media and following the diabolical decision to withdraw the ULF funding. I've been working with Union Learn, put the petition up for Mr. Williamson to see sense. Uh, although I was happy to see Gillian Keegan yesterday uh, expressing her support for your lifelong learning and skills and training on the Festival of Learning Twitter page. So I'm, I'm sure her support is completely heartfelt and she'll have signed the petition and she'll be lobbying Mr. Williamson for us already. Um, <laughs> Let's live in hope. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, the, my last bit was, I think that once you've turned on the activist switch, so I've left the business the, uh, as that I was, um, but the activist switch and supporting your members, it doesn't really stop. So the ULF and the USDAR thing helped me to find that switch, but the redundancy or the threat of redundancy is not going to stop it. So that's where I am. Oh, well, the best of luck to you personally, Sean, and thank you so much for your activism, for Union Learn, political activism, but also um, for your for, for everything you've done so selflessly for your colleagues at work that's in, and fellow members. It's been fantastic and the best of luck for the future. Uh, Gillian, what, what are your plans? And plans, I'm um, doing more strategic stuff at the moment. Um, so my worry around people working from home is their mental health. Um, it was quite hard to work from home. Um, and I know since I've actually been seeing people, they've been so pleased to see an actual human being. So I'm part of the, uh, my employer, the local council's team on uh, health and well-being. We've, they've done several surveys over the last few months and we're just currently going through the results of, of those and, and to see how we can um, help people and make sure that mental health, their mental health is okay from home. 
Um, we are lucky that there hopefully won't be many redundancies in the council this time. That's only because they actually slashed the workforce a couple of years ago. Um, but obviously other employers in the town and there's a huge worry over employment in, in town. Um, so this is a really good opportunity um, to get um, learning into those employers via union learn and uh, other trade unions. Um, I've also been doing the TUC's Green Shoots course. So I'm looking at planning online learning around environmental issues and the environment in the workplace. Uh, I've actually I've really enjoyed that. That's been a, a, a good session. And I also keep in close contact with regional um, and, and other um, colleagues. I am actually planning a online course, which will be the first one that I've actually delivered. Um, with a group of uh, colleagues in South Yorkshire Pensions that are currently having to apply for their own jobs. Uh, and it's all online application as, as well. So they've never done that before. Right. I did previously run a very successful course with them. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, John. OK. Uh, DHL Stoke, we don't foresee any signs of restructuring within the business. We are busier than ever with the next full lockdown coming in towards the end this week. I don't see this changing. However, in the back of our mind, we're still considering the impact of the introduction of more and more automated robots. We have a great working relationship with a company who fully support lifelong learning and reskilling gender. This will help us plan efficiently for the future and ensure that colleagues are able to upskill. An example on our side is the current apprenticeship and they're just doing now the new coaching and mentoring programme, which is called CSCS. So for people who don't know what CSCS is, it's Certified Supply Chain Specialists. So DHL have got a strategy for 2025. Great so stuff. The is that we learn certain topics and talk to members about where the business is going. All right. Very, very useful. So explaining the strategy for the company and how it intends to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. And finally, last but not least, Mark, what are your plans for the next 18 months? Uh, well, I keep people informed constantly by posters. We're very colourful and informative, but quite fun posters about how important learning is. And uh, obviously, I have uh, very good support from Lisa Greenfield, my project manager. But funnily enough, uh, here at uh, headquarters, I'm with Cameron and Ben, and we're actually networking. We've been here since 8 o'clock this morning, networking and banging out ideas of how we're going to move forward in the new year. So uh, basically, just to give it, make it quick and to the point, that's what I'm doing. Very good. And colourful posters are always very useful and quick to the point, because I think we forget how... Uh, time poor people are. If you're going to get them, you've got to catch their attention. I would like to thank you all uh, for a fantastic uh, contribution. Uh, you've been a great panel and thank you very much for um, for being part of the Union Learn Conference in these new times. Uh, I think, aren't we all so modern and digital? It's fantastic. Thank you all for the work you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker. Our speaker is Millie Johnson. Millie is a Sunday Times best-selling author who was born, raised, and still lives in Barnsley, South Yorkshire. Earlier this year, she was honored with the Romantic Novelist Association Outstanding Achievement Award and was a featured author in the reading agency's Quick Reads and Well Book Night campaigns with her book, The Little Dreams of Lara Cliff. I wish it could be Christmas every day is her 18th novel published last week. Millie, we are really pleased to um, have you at Union Learn. Um, I don't know if your camera's on yet. Can you see me now? Can I you can hear me? You. Yes, I can see and hear you. That's fantastic. Well Good. <laughs> welcome, welcome to you. Um, sorry, not welcome to you, welcome to me. Sorry, Hi, it's, uh, well, you know, you're saying that we're all technical. Uh, I'm just getting to grips with this. You know, it makes me feel my age, I think. Um, I'm, I'm here to talk about quick reads and, uh, and literacy and, and why, I, um, why I agreed to do um, a quick reads, one of these little books here. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I, I will say that when, you, when you've always been able to read and write, you take it for granted 
so much that you don't realise how lucky that you are. I, I certainly didn't. Um, and the timing of me writing a quick reads was was quite serendipitous, really, because it, it, it coincided with an invitation I'd had to go into a lady's prison, New Hall in Wakefield. Uh, I wasn't sure what to expect at all. Um, had a lovely day there, as it as it happened, and I I really counted my blessings when I I came home, <clears throat> and I I did learn there from the prison officers. Uh, I mean, Craig, you, you just you you really do count your blessings, you know, uh, totally. But I I learned from a lot of the prison officers that a lot of the women there would say, "I'm not coming in here again." That's it. I, I've, I've done. You won't see me again. And and they go back in. And the reason why so many are stopped from changing their lives is simply low literacy levels. They go back into the community armed with good intentions, but their choice of jobs is limited because they left school with no exams. They can't fill in application forms. So they gravitate back to their dysfunctional comfort zones and the cycle begins again and until I'd been into Newhall I hadn't comprehended how important the skills of being able to read and write competently were and I set myself a, a task of writing down one single day just one single day where I used my skills to read and write because we just we just do it without thinking about it and you, you don't realize how much you employ those skills until you actually do this little exercise, you know, looking to see what's on the TV, reading a newspaper to see what's on the news, reading a bus timetable, sitting in a, a dentist waiting room um, in the old days when you could have caught, uh, passing the time with a magazine, reading labels in supermarkets, following recipes. What if you had a baby formula and you couldn't even read how to mix it up? Not being able to read impacts on everything, safety, health, mental health, enjoyment of life, quality of life. I recently had to fill out a form for my mother, uh, an attendance allowance form, 29 pages. Even I was quite foxed by that. Um, <clears throat> but even how, how would you cope if you had very, very basic literacy skills? So, you know, my, thanks to that, my mum got the, the money that she was actually, um, she was actually due. But how on earth would you cope if you if you couldn't do um, simple things like fill out very, very simple questions? The literacy levels in this country are appalling. One in five adults has the reading age of a five to seven year old. Sorry, ignore that. Now it's one to six. And very shortly, it will be one in, one in seven. You know, um, about eight million people in the UK. That means that they can't read the instructions on a packet of tablets or a simple road sign. We don't just read for leisure. Reading is a life essential skill and its effects are far reaching. And all this was going on in my head when I was asked to write a quick read. And I agreed to it straight away because I know that little changes can lead to massive changes in people's lives. And I want as many people who can't read to learn and what better way to help people learn than to want to make people learn or making it pleasant for them, making it not feel like work that will defeat them or patronise them. Now, once upon a time, adults who sought help were, were given the equivalent, if not the actual Janet and John books, children's simple stories that did absolutely nothing for their already low self-worth. Quick Reads are a, a selection of stories. This is mine. <clears throat> They're written by um, best-selling authors, adults, and we've all taken a lot of care to deliver tales that are every bit, that read every bit as well as, as our longer novels, because we want to encourage not to make people feel incompetent. You know, they, they look like books for adults because they are books for adults. They've just the only difference is that they've got adult themes and simpler language. But the sentences aren't long, they're not complicated, they're not full of clauses, and the vocabulary is simpler. You know, why use discombobulate when the word confuse will do the job adequately? 
And I defy anybody to read one of our books and, and spot any real difference to our longer outputs. They're directed at adults who need to help build up their reading skills, who are off put by big, thick tomes of dense words and, and paragraphs, you know, but they're available to anybody and the font is slightly larger those for those with reduced eyesight. They're perfect for a, a quick read, if you excuse the pun, um, those people who have suffered a stroke and uh, or illness makes um, big books difficult to pick up or their concentration levels are, are, are lacking. These books are not taxing on the brain at all. Uh, George Ormoyce called these books a gateway drug and, and she's right because they're a perfect taster for a rich world of books out there all waiting to be read. And when asked to give a quote about why I was involved, I said that reading is a key to a life enriched. Being able to utilise skills of literacy opens up doors to much bigger and more satisfying and safer lives. Simple, straightforward storytelling, no complicated plots to confuse people, no stupidly long words to make a reader's eye snag and interrupt conversation. Um, but surprisingly challenging to write, you know. At first, I found myself writing in a, in a way that a five-year-old child would have rolled their eyes at. So I changed tack. I wrote the story, which is about four old friends going to Amsterdam for a hen night. And the hen is having doubts that the others um, just put down to wedding nerves. But she's never quite got over her first love. And lo and behold, he turns up on the ferry. And it's down to the magic of Van Gogh and a day out in Amsterdam to sort of head out for her. It's about people having dreams and not comparing them to other people's dreams because your dream is tailor-made for you. Some people's dreams might be to climb Everest. Other people's dreams might be to have a pink bath in their own ensuite. In this book, I attempt to widen Arisa's horizons. I take them on a tour of Amsterdam. And I want them to feel every bump and sway of the ship in the North Sea. But there are other books out there. Adam Kay wrote a, a short one about his experiences of being a junior doctor. A.A. Dan wrote a story um, about um, interracial tensions in Bradford. Uh, Claire McIntosh wrote a, a psychological crime book. And so there, there are books out there for every taste. So we've tried to cater for people's interests. We absorb so much vocabulary and information without trying when we read um you know when people ask me as a novelist do i ever read and I, absolutely yes because I, I i'm still learning we all still learning we, we all come across words that we haven't learned before but people equipped with a wider store of words are more confident because they feel more able to interact with others and they're better equipped for what life throws at them they're more resourceful those with better literary skills get better chances in life, better jobs. So it can be no surprise that there is a correlation between a re restricted vocabulary and low self-esteem. Other benefits of reading. Reading is a magnificent sleep aid. It relaxes and rests the brain, it powers it down. Reading also sharpens our ability to focus and concentrate, skills that we are in danger of losing with this modern technological age which presses us to multitask. We watch TV whilst texting or checking in to see what other people's take is on, on Twitter, on the thing that you're watching on TV. When we go to a, watch a band, we record it on our phones instead of living it and creating memories. But reading demands our whole attention to make sense of what is going on in the story. And being forced to do one thing only, but properly, lessens our stress levels. Reading switches our brain, gives it power, improves memory function, staves off dementia. It's lose it or use it muscle that needs stimulation. Reading gives solace and escapism for people with anxiety. The poorly who need to forget for a couple of hours that they're hooked up to a chemotherapy drip. It detracts from stress. Reading a good story can do what no film can do. It allows you to tailor make a hero and a heroine fashioned from our imagination. How many of us watched Fifty Shades of Grey and thought, nope, that's not how I imagined Christine at all? 
you know, in my head, I'd got the film of how he looked. It's a lovely, gentle pastime he's reading and one in three adults don't read for pleasure, which is a, a travesty. Reading educates us as we read factual books about the experiences of others, makes us see what is possible, encourages us to, to make changes for the better. Reading gives people insight into what healthy relationships should be. I've had more than one letter from women who didn't actually realise they were living in abusive relationships until they read objectively the stories, the experience of one of my characters in the book and the penny dropped and she got out of that relationship. Such is the power of books. Reading gives us a wider um, understanding of the world in general. It reminds us of the impact of, of people's actions upon others, prompt us to be mindful of the pleasure that we can give or the harm that we can inflict. Reading is free if you use the library. Millions of books out there to lengthen the life of, of people. And these, they're, they're only, these are in all the libraries and they're only quid in shops anyway. Um, they're, they're as cheap as chips and, and they can turn reluctant readers into confident ones. These little books can change lives and have. And there are wider implications on society for reading. Being literate unlocks more chances in the job market. More vacancies are filled. The pressure on the welfare system is relieved. Literacy improves confidence, lessens stress. That impacts on the health service, which is groaning under the weight of patients with mental health issues. The economy benefits, crime levels drop, all from people being able to read a little more. And in this present climate, from goodness, reading really can benefit people more than ever. Our education system is suffering. Excessive accountability and figure target satisfying. The pressure for data jobs has been taken, uh, is taking our, our teachers away from teaching. Grassroots, children need to be able to read and write adequately because almost everything in their future adult lives will depend upon it. Governments, please let our teachers teach. That's why they join the profession in the first place. Um, I have no idea why the Quick Read project was ever in danger. You know, the government could have stepped in to pledge money to keep it open. It would have been cheap at the price for all the money that it would have saved. This is base level stuff. It does not need a team of financial experts to see the return they get for their cash. There are only advantages in learning how to read. I say again, reading is a key to a life enriched. It will stop all those women in prison, you know, uh, going out and repeat offenders because they can get out of these dysfunctional cycles. It is a key to a life happier and more fulfilled, a life with more choice and less stress. And it will and does start for many with one of these little books, Price It A Quick. Tell me a better investment than that. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I, uh, I'm a passionate woman about reading, as you can probably gather. <laughs> I, I would love to have your speech. I'd love to have a copy of your speech because I'm an English okay. teacher. I'm an English teacher yeah. and I have never, ever heard such a fantastic um, exposition about the power of reading and why it's oh, so important for mental health and your physical health and uh to your to, for me i i go back to if i'm feeling down i go back to either pride and prejudice or a room with a view and i've, I've reread them i don't know how many times but i'll go yeah. back and i'll read and it'll make me feel better so many yeah. thank you so much it's a, it's an absolute pleasure but yes of course i will uh I'll let you just just bob me an email and i'll send it to you no worries at all wonderful it, thank you so only, for, only 100 pound yeah, that's I'm joking. Great stuff. <laughs> I'm joking. It's been lovely, lovely. It's a fantastic speech. Thank you so much, Lily, and thank you for your thank quick you. reads. I want to read your book as well. I can't wait. Oh, uh, more, 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 more customers. Keep them rolling in. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lily. That was just great. That was just fantastic. And now our next speaker needs no introduction, so, but I am introducing him. Uh, he, he spoke at last year's Union Learn Conference to say Manawa, and he's a spoken word poet, he's a writer, he's an actor from Ilford. In uh, gosh, how do you follow that, Kevin? I don't know how you follow that, but we're going to, before we end this plenary session, 
I'd like to invite Kevin Rowan, who's the Director of Union Learn, to close the plenary section of the conference. So Kevin, over to you. Hi, Mary. Yeah, you're on. Oh, good, thank you. My, my, my computer just decided to give me some strange message just as that came on. I was panicking for a second. I mean, how do you follow that? I mean, uh, I, I want to take a few minutes really just to thank everybody who's contributed uh, uh, to, to the conference today and really it's no surprise when we uh, when you look at the chat box uh, uh, both Hussein and Millie have got such a, a fantastic response from uh, everybody who, who's at the conference today uh, with those messages about how important words and reading uh, are to our ability to communicate and to share our humanity uh, really with each other uh, really you know fantastic uh, moving stuff and it's always great to, to kind of hear from, uh, from from people like that who have that kind of creative uh, ability to kind of explain our feelings in a way which really resonate uh, with us all and how important as Millie was saying that the ability to, to read uh, uh, you know, uh, is in order to help us to kind of communicate those feelings to express uh, our kind of thoughts and concerns, as as she described it, as uh, uh, you know, the importance of reading in, in access in life. Uh, so uh, a massive thanks to Hussein uh, and Millie uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks, obviously, to uh, Francis and Kate for uh, kicking us off this morning. Uh, two really, really kind of powerful, uh, powerful women in in the world and in uh, in our economy and society and political environment and. And such strong encouragement really for the the job that we've got in front of us to to make sure that we're all able to keep doing the work that we're doing uh, in, in learning maybe come back to that uh, in in a second or two uh mary and, and thanks to, to stephen uh, learning at work institute great support uh, uh, of all the work that we do to try and enable workers uh, to access learning and i would uh, really encourage people to join in some of the festival of learning events uh, this week uh, to, to Anne, to Judith and Tony, I mean, that industrial focus uh, is always really important to us in the TUC. You know, while, while learning is good in its own right and really critical in its own right, it's also really important to the economy. Uh, and to have that kind of reminded from people very active in that world is, uh, is really important to us too. And thanks, obviously, really to, uh, to Sean, Linda, uh, Mark, John and Gillian, uh, and Iram, Julie, Shirley, Gemma, Beverly, uh, uh, Verica and, uh, and 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 late Karen uh, for all of the fantastic examples that they show of of union learning reps really at the height of their game and making a, a very massive difference. Uh, obviously, thanks to Yusuf and the team for organising events and, and for your your wonderful chairman, Mary. I think you've had to probably work harder uh, today than than uh, having everybody uh, in, in the room. So thank thank you for your leadership uh, in union learn. Uh, and maybe Mary, if I can just make a couple of comments about the, yeah. the extraordinary, extraordinary situation we're in. We are facing huge challenges across the economy and society. And for me, who's a lifelong trade unionist, the work that our reps do is, is an incredible inspiration for me. We are facing massive challenges to keep people safe at work. I was on a call with uh, Bears this morning, so I missed the start of the conference, but it's absolutely clear that unionised workplaces with union safety rules are safer than any other workplace at a time where we need everybody to be safe at work. Uh, for those that aren't uh, be able to kind of, you know, work in their workplaces and are working from home, the work that some of our union learning reps talked about earlier uh, has been an incredible support for individuals, whether that's how to deal with uh, you know, being isolated, some of those kind of human skills, if you like, around how we communicate, building those digital skills so that people can keep in touch or enabling people to continue learning. And I'm so pleased that as Union Learn, you know, on the 1st of April this year, we launched the Learning at Home initiative, which has now helped thousands and thousands of people to be able to continue their learning, but also to be able to, you know, cope with what it means to be working from home in a very atomized, an isolated way uh, in, the, in the kind of current situation. And of course we know, and we've heard from, uh, I think it was Sean around some of the kind of challenges that we're facing uh, economically. 
whilst you know there are lots of kind of pressures in the economy and we know i think as, as tony burke said that lots of people are are facing redundancy and lots of people are likely to be to be losing their jobs that the value of unions and the support of union learning reps is going to help those people in a way that they aren't getting help from anywhere else whether that's skills in cv writing or interview skills or some of the, the, the stuff that we know unions do fantastically well around uh, literacy, numeracy, digital skills, or technical skills to enable people to uh, uh, to be able to move from one job to another. Now has never been a more important time for that investment uh, in learning. So it does absolutely beg a belief that we've had the decision that we've had uh, from Gavin Williamson, and we are going to work extremely hard to try and uh, turn around because there is nobody, nobody that agrees with that decision. We spoke to other government ministers who don't agree. We spoke to officials at the most senior level in the Department for Education who don't agree. The only person who thinks this is a right decision is Gavin Williamson. So we've got to work really hard to try and turn that around. And we know that the need is immense. At a time where we need people to be able to access skills and support, the opposite is the case. And we hear the government say that they're on the side of working people and doing their best for working people. Well, let's test that out. We're at a point where employer investment in skills is at an all time low. And there are some good employers out there without question. And some of them are probably on this call and most of them are being good on skills because of the work that unions do to make them good on skills. But employer investment in skills is at an all time low. Government investment in skills is at an all time low. There's never been less state investment in skills in the economy the only the only areas of the economy that are doing all right on skills are those where unions and union learning reps are making it happen in the workplace so when you hear the government say they're on the side of, of working people test it against that criteria because the evidence suggests uh, that they're not and we need to expose that and we need to turn around the decision on uh, on you on the future uh, of union uh, learning fund and resources so there is an ask really for everybody thanks for everything everybody's done on the campaign so far as as francis and others have said we've had lots of some uh, support i think the petition is now well over thirty six thousand. we need to get that higher and uh, we need more employers to say how important union learning is to them and we need everybody on this call to be contacting your MPs and getting your members to contact MPs to say this isn't something that we can uh, let stand. I'm not too shy to ask for help. I am asking for help because we need as much help uh, as we as we can get. Uh, and and finally, Mary, you know, because th there is a campaign to save Union Learn Fund, but the work that unions do is bigger than that, and the work that unions do on learning is bigger than that. So I want to take this opportunity. Uh, to thank everybody uh, for all of the work that they do. I think, as, as Millie said, uh, you know, reading is, is, is the key to enriching life. And I absolutely agree with that. And, and learning and writing and all of the kind of skills that union learning reps bring are absolutely critical to, to, to enrichment. And it's union learning reps that are unpicking the lock that those keys fit. And I want to just thank everybody for all of the work that they do to help workers, because that is an absolute demonstration of the humanity that Hussein was talking about. Mm. If there was a personification of the poems that we've heard today, it's union learning rep doing their bit on a voluntary basis, going much far beyond uh, anything that anyone can expect of them in order to support and help their colleagues and their community. So thank you. Have great workshops. And thank you again, Mary. All the best, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Kevin, and uh, thank you for all that you're doing as director of Union Learn. I know that the immense work that you're doing to try and change Gavin Williamson's mind and to get a coalition of the willing to change Gavin Williamson's mind so that we can continue with the fantastic work that Union Learn does. So um, that's the end of the, um, you know, the whole conference. We are going to be moving to workshops. It's now 12.38, so I'm going to put the workshops back to 12.45 um, for the, you know, uh, for, for, for those, so you get seven minutes to go to the loo 
and have a wee, which is where I'm going to be dashing in a minute. I think that over the past few years, the Union Learn Conference has been inspiring and wonderful. And I think that today that has been the same again. It's been inspiring and it's been wonderful. I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved in preparing it. These conferences don't just happen. They take a huge amount of organisation and particularly when you're moving to a completely new platform, a huge amount of technical spill and expertise. I'd like to thank Yusuf who's worked so hard behind the scenes to keep the show on the road this morning. And I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this conference and for your involvement in Union Learn, either as staff or and particularly as Union Learn reps. We will keep fighting, we will try and keep the flame alive and we'll try, try to uh, safeguard Union Learning for the future workers and for present workers who in these times need it more than ever, needs, needs learning and development and skills development more than ever. So thank you for being on the conference today and the workshops will start at 12.45. Thank you very much.